Hi friends, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us for an entire year. Can you believe it? It has been a whole year since we first started connecting like this. We want to invite you to join us for this replay of 2020's Live from the Living Room Maundy Thursday service. It is so important to center ourselves around Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus, at the start of this Easter weekend. So friends, enjoy. Anyways, it is Thursday, and it is the Thursday before Easter Sunday. And at Charleswood Community Church, our tradition is to have a Monday Thursday service. And so this is a really unique service. I didn't, I didn't grow up having a service like this, and so I was intrigued by it when, when we started having them a number of years ago. Um, and typically what the service involves is some sort of um, version of a Seder meal, a Passover meal. Um, we've done things where we've had like a full meal. We've done things where we've had soup, like a lentil soup and, and uh, flatbread, sort of um, reminiscent of what the um, disciples might have eaten. Um, the night before Jesus was taken and crucified. Um, and we, so we've done that kind of thing. And then we've, other, we've also done things where it's more like, almost like a tasting of the, some different elements and what they represent. And uh, then the evening also involves a little bit of singing always. And um, we do foot washing, which is something that we don't practice all the time, but we do get to do it on, on Monday, Thursday. And um, it's a really meaningful time. And then we will celebrate communion together. And then we finish with what's called a tenebrae. And what that is, is 12 candles lined up and um, we lower the lights in the room and we read portions of scriptures, just sort of whoever is there, um, whoever feels led to go up and read. And when they finish reading, they extinguish the candle. And so as the candles are extinguished, you can imagine that the room starts to get darker and then we leave in silence and you know it's such an experiential event and yeah. it's so cool because you really get the feeling like you were one of the disciples like you're kind of hidden away we do it in in the fireside room at the church so it's a little bit of a smaller space and there usually isn't too many people there but you get the feeling of really um, that 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 being hidden away and and kind of tucked into the darkness and you experience a little bit of what the disciples might have felt that night um, the night before prophecy was fulfilled the night before Jesus was taken and and uh, and they watched their friend and their Messiah crucified and it's you know there's something really valuable about being able to do that and being able to sort of put yourself in that spot at least for a little while. Tonight is different. And I mean, how many times can we say it, right? But there's just, everything is different right now. You can't even go grocery shopping the way you normally would. Gavin was at Costco the other day and the lineup was a million miles long and he was out there 45 minutes even just waiting to get in. I mean, I guess that's not that abnormal for Costco. Yeah. That's kind of Costco-ish anyways. I'd wait 45 minutes for Costco. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about I wouldn't. But regardless, everything is different now. And so tonight on Monday, Thursday, as much as we would like to be gathered in the dark fireside room and, and getting to experience together the, the taste and the touch and even the smell of the candles, um, we're here. Well, it was kind of a busy day today. We were in the midst of uh, taping and, and whatnot. And in the midst of my, my day, I got this phone call from uh, a reporter and a reporter, a local reporter, he just wanted to talk about what, how local churches were handling COVID-19 and, and what we usually did for Passion Week or Holy Week, this, this time leading up to Easter. And so he was asking about, okay, so what does Charleswood Community Church do? And so I was explaining, well, Good Friday and buffet and, and all the breakfast and communion and family time and, and then Easter Sunday, but then I would start talking about Monday, Thursday. And he was listening and he was kind of asking a couple of questions and he said, okay, well, hold, hold on a sec. So does this celebration go from like Monday to Thursday? Is this, so this is Monday, Thursday, oh. and I'm like, 
No, 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 no. This is not a four-day festival <laughs> or anything like that. It, it's Maundy Thursday, not Monday Thursday. And I explain, Maundy is, is a term that comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means command, and this is John 13. Or sorry, this, yeah, John 13, verses 34 and 35, when Jesus tells his disciples, a new command I give you, that you love one another. And so this, this new command, this, this command, is the whole basis for Maundy Thursday. So with that understanding going forward, I just wanted to make a couple of comments on this Maundy Thursday. And so I was going to ask the question, how do people know that you're a Christian? How do people know that you're a Christian? Uh, maybe they see you get up on Sundays, uh, Sunday mornings when people are preparing for, are they either sleeping in or preparing for brunch or, or something like that, and they see you driving off. Maybe they see you carrying a Bible. Maybe you wear Christian t-shirts. Maybe there's just certain things about you. At work, maybe you have, or you drive, you have a little bumper sticker or something. You listen to Christian music. So there's all kinds of ways that we identify uh, to uh, the larger uh, population that we're, that we belong to a certain subculture, a certain group. But the biblical answer is very simple. It's love. That's it. It's love. And Jesus says, listen, um, by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's the the basis for people knowing that we are Christ followers, that we're followers of Jesus. And it's not a, a, it's not any kind of love as well. I mean, a lot of us uh, are familiar with loving people and loving things and, and loving a country and whatever else. And, and there's many different kinds of love as well, and different shades of it as well. But the kind of love that Jesus is talking about he's, is this, and he says this again in this new command that he gives his disciples. He says, as I have loved you, that's how you're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love each other with the love of Jesus, and that's it. And so as I was reading again some of these, these stories around Easter and, and Good Friday and, and the, the events that happened in what we call Monday Thursday and leading up to it, and all these ideas about love and, and the way in which people will know that we're, we're Christians, not by the, the doctrine or the, all the smarts that we have or, or, or knowing certain things, memorizing Bible verses, but by the quality of the love that we have for each other that Jesus gives us. So I was reading these stories, and again, I was, I was just struck by how far short the disciples fall and how, fall, how, how uh, far short I fall as well as a disciple. So Becky's just going to read um, a passage from Luke 22, and this really sets up the contrast between Jesus and the, the way the disciples react as well. And it really tells me again that I'm glad it's not up to us our external behavior that people can tell that we're Christians or not, because if it were, we'd, we'd uh, fall real short, just like the disciples. So Luke 22, starting at verse 39, Becky's going to read a few verses about this, this pivotal event. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. He touched the man's ear and healed him. 
Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Thank you. So... In this passage, it's just remarkable the the parallels and the contrast between Jesus and the ones who say that they love him, his followers, and and the the contrast is is remarkable. Jesus prays the disciples sleep. Uh, Jesus wants to do God's will, and the disciples fall into temptation. Jesus' way is peace, and the disciples lash out in violence. Uh, Jesus heals and the disciples flee and again Jesus wants to be with us and Peter follows at a distance and the disciples just are are marked by just this terrible terrible follow-through they they misunderstand Jesus all the way all the way to Jerusalem they're bickering about who's gonna be the greatest and and they're completely missing what Jesus has to say they're scared, they're exhausted, they do fall into temptation, and at the very last, when Jesus needs them, they scatter, and they're gone. And I was reading this, and I was just struck by this, this whole thing, fear and fatigue, frustration, ignorance, all these things drive us away and keep us isolated and drive us away from Jesus. And repentance and love and humility and and a hunger for the real presence of God not just being entertained by God those things bring us closer to God and all those things again just drive us to this decision what do we want do we want to be entertained or do we want to Jesus when he's convenient or do we really want to dig in and follow him even though there's times of real trouble and real challenge uh, maybe you've heard this expression these days. Um, do continue to be socially distant, but not spiritually distant. And I think what that phrase in church circles is talking about is, is again, this, this idea, draw near to, to Jesus. If we need to be apart uh, physically from each other, at least draw near to Jesus. And that just reminds me of a couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 10. And I just want to leave you with, with these verses because uh, we don't want to be spiritually distant, do we? We don't want to find ourselves adrift and make the same mistakes that we see the disciples making as they fall prey to fear and ignorance and frustration and anger and they then they just end up scattered. So Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to God. And that's, folks, on Maundy Thursday, that's the great message that we have. Drawing near to God, even if we have to be socially distant from our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can still draw near to God because our hearts have been cleansed and our this guilty conscience and all the other reasons are gone away. And, and we can feel and we can be committed to that love that Jesus has for us, not on any other basis, but for the love that Jesus has for us. And that is something, again, that we can celebrate on Monday, Thursday. So let us draw near to Jesus as Becky's gonna sing a song for us.
I trust that was helpful. Friends, we can find ourselves spiritually adrift when we are not anchored in the saving love of Jesus. And the power of Monday Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, it brings us back to those events. It brings us back to the words and the actions of our Lord and Savior. And we're there again. Thank you for joining us tonight. We invite you to our Good Friday and our Easter Sunday service, 9.30 and 11 o'clock, in person here. Check our website and book your times. And if they're all full up, hey, you can still join us at 11 o'clock on Good Friday, 11 o'clock on Sunday as well. Uh, join us for live streaming. God's people need to be together on this Easter weekend. Friends, God be with you this Easter.